I'm delighted to be here. Uh, Budapest is one of my favorite European cities, and I always love to come here. That was one of the reasons, second being Matthias, the old friend, asked me to, and I couldn't refuse him. Uh, but uh, both of them made very clear that I wanted to come here. Um, my talk today uh, actually is drawn and somewhat changed because I'm speaking to a non indological audience here, but it is um, extracted from a book I've just finished, uh, which uh, is part of a series that Sheldon Pollock, somebody, you know him, uh, who teaches at the Institute of Columbia, uh, Columbia University, um, uh, is putting together about 17, 18 of us are collaborating, each one preparing one, one volume. So they'll be all together in the series, about 17, 18 volumes. These are called the historical source books of classical Indian thought. And the, and the uh, aim of this, uh, this series is to show through original and accurate and accessible translations of ancient Indian texts how Indian intellectuals went about their task of grappling with uh, intellectual uh, issues and questions, how they disagreed with each other, and you can, you can, you can narrate a history. Uh, there's a narrative here to be told about how Indian um, scholars, uh, native scholars, dealt with significant um, intellectual issues, such as logic, mm, such as what I'm dealing today, uh, my own topic, is law. Uh, so, that's, so this is sort of a little extract from that, just to put it in context. OK, so let me get to my talk here. The very title of my talk, <clears throat> in the very title of my talk, I have unfortunately introduced three terms, all of which elude a clear definition, even though we all pretend to know what they mean. The terms are law, religion, and dharma. I will not test your patience by examining the broad semantic compass of dharma, although I will have much to say about it during the course of this talk. Religion, what can I say? Forty years ago when I was young and foolish, I tried to find an adequate definition of religion. I have now given that up as a fool's errand. Law on the surface appears to be the least difficult of the three. But dig a little deeper and we are confounded. The new Oxford English Dictionary, the 20 volume behemoth, devotes 12 columns to defining or describing law. Do I have this? Um, I'll just turn this on. Oh. Oops. Just to keep you awake, I thought I'll show you some things here, right? Uh, but they are basically, I hope it comes. Uh, they are basically slides of texts, and uh, I heard something. Uh, but it takes some time sometimes, yeah. Yeah, I see the, there we go. Um, because uh, I will be dealing with, uh, with texts, and it is always good for you to have it actually on the board. I find in my, when my students I deal with, because when I say it out loud, it just you know, goes through your, um, through your head without uh, registering it. <clears throat> okay, so now, um, okay, so let's get to this definition of the OED. It says the body of rules, whether proceeding from formal enactment or from custom, which a particular state or community recognizes as binding on its members or subjects. So you find a lot of complexity already introduced into this, uh, this one definition of many that it gives. The wonderful online dictionary, which I often use, gives several definitions that are instructive. And here we go. See how many there are? Uh, a rule of conduct or procedure established by custom agreement or authority. The body of principles or precepts held to express the divine will, especially as revealed in the Bible. A code of principles based on morality, conscience, or nature. A statement describing a relationship observed to be invariable between or among phenomena for all cases in which the specified conditions are met. For example, the law of gravity. A principle of, of organization, procedure, or techniques, for example, the laws of grammar. One invariable attribute of law is its injunctive or binding quality. 
the law either should be followed or is invariably followed. The law thou shalt not kill is meant to express an obligation, which, however, may not always be followed. The law of gravity is invariably followed by physical objects. The close connection between law and religion has been taken for grant, for, as a given, especially in those based on a legal system such as Judaism and Islam. This is also true, I will argue, in the case of Brahmanical Hinduism based on the concept of Dharma. The system built around the concept of Dharma is undoubtedly, I think, a legal system. The very vocabulary and methods of argumentation employed by scholars within the system, whether Dharma Shastra or jurisprudence or Mimangsa, Vedic exegesis, attest to this. Dharma is said to derive from chodana or command or order, and it is expected expressed in vidhi and nisheda, injunction and prohibition. Only sentences containing verbs with an injunctive meaning, such as the optative and the gerundive, here I come to Sanskrit, <laughs> uh, can contain legally binding rules. All this, for example, if somebody says, uh, uh, you will uh, honor your father and mother, that is not dharma, because it doesn't ask you to do it. You know, it says it as a statement. It must have an injunctive verb, you shall hmm, or you should do something. Okay. All this is the hallmark of law. Indeed, dharma covers most, if not all, areas covered by the English term law, including moral, ritual, civil and criminal law. But of course, dharma, the um, semantic compass of dharma, is much broader than the English concept of law. H. L. A. Hart, who taught law uh, at the University of Oxford um, in the 1960s, his uh, magisterial work, The Concept of Law, uh, uh, on the philosophy of law, presents an important classification of law into primary and secondary rules. Primary rules are the norms that govern individual and group activities of the thou shall not steal variety. This is easy to understand and it is to this variety that most people apply the term law. Most significant for the philosophy of law and for for my own work, however, is Hart's concept of secondary rules, especially what he calls the rule of recognition. He divides secondary rules into rule of recognition and the rules of adjudication. Adjudication is clear, there's a legal procedure, how does a court proceed, right, uh, in order to uh, find a man innocent or convict him. The rule of recognition, on the other hand, simply put, provides both the ordinary citizens and state officials, especially judges, the criteria for identifying what is valid law and what is not. Scott Shapiro presents Hart's rules in more precise language than Hart himself did. According to Hart, every legal system necessarily contains one and only one rule which sets out the test of validity for that system. I will contest whether it is only one because some systems may have more than one. The systemic test of validity specifies those properties, the possession of which by a rule renders it binding in that system. Any norm that bears one of the marks of authority set out in the rule of recognition is a law that of that system and officials are required to recognize it when carrying out their official duties. In other words, the rule of recognition deals with epistemology. Or in the case of jurist, uh, Indian jurists, they call it pramana. Pramana is that which gives you new knowledge. Hmm? Where do we find law? Or in the present case, dharma. If you are in Hungary, you are supposed to obey Hungarian law. Where the hell do I find Hungarian law? Right? That's the question we are talking about. Yeah? It has been accepted from a very early time by both Dharmashastrin, which are the jurists. Dharmashastra is that scholarly tradition that uh, have written treatises on the term Dharma and law. Uh, and the second one, companion tradition, is called Mimangsa, and that is the exegetical tradition of India. And both the Dharmashastrin and the Mimangsakas, the Vedic exegetes, that the Veda provides what they call the mula or the root or the foundation 
or the source, all those things are contained within the concept of root of valid dharma. Veda is the epistemic source, the pramana of dharma. And here are some early formulations of this principle from about the 3rd century BC to about the 1st century. Veda is the epistemic source of Pramana of Dharma as stated in the 2nd century BCE document of Gautama in the very first sentence, the very first one here. Veda is the root of Dharma. This position is repeated in various forms in all the legal treatises. Uh, we have four ancient texts on Dharma uh, and, um, and uh, I say this upper number I think is the oldest, Gautama is the second. Um, and what these try to do in presenting the Veda as the foundation is provide a transcendental foundation for what they consider to be law both in the context of religion and morality as well as in normal sense of criminal and civil law. In these early treatises, however, the question whether all of Dharma is based on the Veda or the Veda is the sole source of Dharma is not addressed directly. The embarrassing fact as Apastamba, this my second guy, writing in the 3rd century BCE probably understood is that very little of what passes for law or dharma in ancient India and found in the Dharma Shastras is found in the extant Vedic text. They simply are not there. So he characterizes dharma as, I have it here, I have to go back here. This one, this one. Uh, here in Sanskrit, it says Samaya Tarikan Dharman Vyakyas Yamaha. And he says, um, the, I shall describe the dharmas that are derived from agreed upon normative practice. And he places Veda at the very end of his discussion as almost an afterthought. You see, they ultimately say Vedascha and the Vedas. Gautama gives two further sources in his second sentence. Oops, sorry, go back a little. Uh, in the second part of his treatise, uh, it says, and the recollection and conduct of those who know it. Mm? So there is a secondary uh, epist episteme of dharma. It is not explicitly stated that dharma within these two says, um, uh, sources is directly derived from the Veda. Baudhayana, the third of our authors, uh, Baudhayana's presentation makes that connection even less obvious. He is from about the second century before Christ. Dharma is taught in each Veda. In accordance with that, we will explain it. What is given in texts of recollection is the second. The tradition of the cultured elite is the third. This is a real problem here in the Sanskrit because the term smriti that you find uh, here. This one here, Smriti. The term Smriti refers both to memory and therefore recollection, uh, as well as texts recording that recollection. All the Dharma Shastras are called Smritis. So this, this text sort of go from one meaning to the other imperceptibly. So in English, unfortunately, we have to make a choice. And that choice always makes it clearer than it actually is. Manu, who is the most celebrated of the Dharma Shastric authors, who wrote probably according to me about the second century after Christ, so several centuries after these fellows. Manu's celebrated verse gives five epistemic sources of Dharma without making any explicit statement about how and whether they are connected to each other or to the Veda. Uh, here, this is the last one there. The entire Veda is the root of dharma as also the recollection and conduct of those who know it, likewise the practice of good people and satisfaction of the self. So five things are put out there. The impetus to view the Veda as the one and only true source, the singular foundation of dharma, probably came from the Mimamsa tradition of Vedic exegesis. It's the root text, Jaiminis Mimamsa Sutra, sometime during the first half of the first millennium after Christ, at the very outset says, dharma is something beneficial disclosed by a Vedic injunction. So, 
but must realize that for these people who are in this tradition, law for the most part is religious and ritual. How do you perform a ritual properly? And that's the sort of the basis on, on which they make. And in this particular statement here, at least in the interpretation of its first major commentator, Shabara, who's in the fifth century after Christ, asserts that dharma is based solely on the Veda. If this is true, namely that the only source of dharma is the Veda, If this is true, namely that the only source of dharma is the Veda, a hypothetical opponent, and this is this are now we are going to scholastic. So we have just like in the in St. Thomas's, you know, uh, summa theologie, you have the opponent first and the person coming in. So this always going opponent is called in Sanskrit the Purva Paksha hmm? and the Uttara Paksha, the first side and the second side. Hmm? So hypothetical opponent is presented in the Mimangsa Sutra 131 as rejecting all other sources such as the legal treatises like the Smritis uh, uh, called uh, and he says because Vedic texts are the foundation of Dharma anything lying outside the Vedic text should be disregarded so this is the most right-wing position hmm? the most conservative position this position is refuted by the next sentence or other recollection is authoritative insofar as there is an inference because of the identity of the authors in the second round probably uh, the, the author is probably wrong identity of the performers in other words the argument is that the rituals that are prescribed in the Veda and the rituals that are prescribed in the Smritis are performed by the same individuals so it, they must have a similar authority here we here we get to the theory of what is known uh, in in Vedic exegesis as the inferred Veda, the Anumita Shruti. Often the Veda is called Shruti because it is heard. Huh? It is not something that is written down that people can recite it. So the inference of a Vedic text can be based on a Smriti. Shabra says, let's say here, that's a long one. We must infer a cause for the stability of this very recollection, Smriti. But it is not experience because that is impossible for human beings are unable to experience this kind of act in this very birth and they do not remember what they experienced in previous births a text however could be inferred because of the identity of the performers of the acts enjoyed in the Vedas and in texts of recollection therefore the connection to the Veda made by people of the three social classes is quite appropriate in other words, they are trying to show that all of the Smritis are actually based on the Veda. So what they say is de facto from the Veda. If some Vedic texts that are the sources of specific Dharma rules are to be inferred because they cannot be found in the available text, so-called Pratyaksha Shruti, the Shruti in front of our eyes, although it is actually in front of our ears, it's heard, not seen. Uh, the question, I mean, these are the two uh, two major, uh, major um, epistemic sources of knowledge in Indian, in Indian logic. Hmm? Perception, Pratyaksha, and inference, Anumana. So the two things, just like Aristotelian logic. So if we have to infer this text, where are those texts? What happened to them? That's the question that needs to be asked. And these people are trying to answer this and I'm, what I'm going there is to show how difficult it is intellectually for them to answer this question and how some people ultimately gave up uh, and said can do it. Broadly two answers are given by the jurists. First the texts have to be inferred that have to be inferred have been lost. We just don't have them anymore right due to historical vicissitudes right people who knew it died and others never learned it. Second, the texts are currently available, but they are so scattered. India is such a large place. The guys may be in Kashmir, I don't know, right? I can't find it, right? So, across this vast subcontinent, that it's impossible for a single individual to find them all. The first solution appears to be very old, at least with reference to some ritual rules. Apastamba, whom we met in the third century BC, says injunctions are given in the Brahmanas. Brahmanas are the middle Vedic texts, liturgical texts. Of these, the lost readings are inferred from usage. Shabara, 
again writing in the 5th century CE, also elicits this theory when he bases the inference on the fact that people may have forgotten some Vedic text. And Kumarila, who is a 7th century scholar, who wrote a sub-commentary on the commentary of Shabara, these are all these scholastic things, right, um, explicitly refers to this theory. The hypothesis of a scattered Veda, to my knowledge, first proposed by this guy himself, Kumarila, who doesn't like the lost Veda theory. Both are discussed by the two 9th century commentators of two major legal treatises of India, Vishwarupa, who comments on the Dharma Shastra or legal treatise of Yanyavalkya, probably a text of the 4th or 5th century after Christ, and Medhatiti, who is this major commentary on the text of Mano, who we have referred to already from the 2nd century. So I will from now on deal with three guys, um, four guys, Shabara, Kumarila, Vishwarupa, and Medhatiti. Okay? Time to do it like class here. All right. So the Vedic exegetes Shabara and Kumarila are completely wedded to the thesis that the Veda is the singular source of Dharma, all Dharma. We must recognize, however, that they are solely concerned with ritual laws, you know, such as the Sharia or the, or the, or the, um, or, or the Jewish equivalents of that. Right? With Dharma defined as rules governing ritual lives of individuals, especially Brahmins, the community of Brahmins, the priests. Their arguments and counter-arguments of their hypothetical opponents, or Purupakshas, provide significant insight into the debates of the, on the theory of Dharma, is based solely on the Veda during the period between the 5th and 7th century. So it's an interesting insights into ongoing debates, intellectual debates. The Mimamsa Sutra 131 cited above is presented by Shabara as an opponent's viewpoint. It is the most radical interpretation of the principle. Nothing outside of the Veda is an epistemic source of Dharma, not even the Smritis or Dharma Shastras, such as that of Manu, which had gained such prominence at that time. This is long. The opponent lists several common injunctions that are not found in the extant Veda. These include, one should perform the eighth day right Ashtaka. This is sort of the classic example of a Vedic ritual that is not found in the Veda. Right? Should we do it or should we not? <laughs> then others are more common things like one should establish watering places so that people can drink water. Right? Uh, oh, one should walk behind one's teacher. You all know that, right? Uh, one should dig reservoirs. One should uh, and one should perform rites of fashioning a top knot on the head. This is the classic example of how uh, hair was carried by, by Brahmins in India. With regard to these common rules, the question arises when we do not find a Vedic text with regard to something, while well, Smritis, meaning Dharma Shastras, state that this act should be performed in this manner and for this purpose, is that act similarly authoritative or not? Is it Dharma, in other words? It is in answer to this question that the above statement is given. The opponent concludes, it was already stated that Dharma is disclosed by Vedic texts. Such a thing, the rules given above, Therefore, should be disregarded because it lacks the foundation. What is not found in the Veda should be disregarded. It is not Dharma. Against this hard-nosed position of the opponent, Shabara takes a jab at establishing the authority of Smritis, viewed both as recollection and text presenting that recollection, as I have been trying to say, by saying, oh, now what did I do? Oh, wrong button. And he says, nevertheless, just as recollection of these individuals is authoritative, when they say, this is the Veda, in other words, how do you know what is the Veda? Because these people say, what I say is the Veda. If we agree to that, because that recollection, because that recollection has come down in an unbroken line down the generations, so also this recollection of theirs, when they say, this is found in the Smriti, theirs must be authoritative. You must realize, and just to aside here, that the Brahmanical, mainstream Brahmins thought that the Veda was self-existent. It was never authored by anybody. It's called Apaurusheya, without a human or divine author. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a transcendent, self-existing knowledge. It's like a, uh, you know, because you should, it's like a, like a radio station that is played from transcendent. So it's just, if you have the right equipment, you can hear it, right? That kind of thing. 
The opponent rejects this by focusing on the definition of recollection or memory. So he, the opponent comes back to think, look at the term memory, smriti, right? It is not possible to recall something that one has not perceived, pratyaksha. The recollection, this is the Veda is possible because the Veda is accessible to perception. But it is impossible to recall injunctions that were never the subject of a perception in the form of a Vedic text encoding those injunctions. These, are, these people are very conservative. They say, unless I find the text which says with an injunctive verb, say you have to do this, no dharma. That's, the opponent is dismissive of any reference. Um, this may of, of any inference based on such erroneous recollections. And this is his sort of jab at this, you know, quite. Um, it is like this, some, I mean, you can see the whole thing of blind man leading the blind, right? Some individual who was born blind may say, I recall this specific form. When he's questioned, where did you get this prior cognition? He would point to another man who was also born blind. And where did he get it from? Someone else born blind. Thus, even if there is a continuous line of people born blind, learned men will never conclude this is a correct <coughs> observation. Therefore, these kinds of things should not be treated seriously. They should be discarded or di disregarded. Shabara, whose opponent this guy is, right, turns to a new argument contained in uh, Mimanga Sutra 132, or rather the recollection is authoritative because of the identity of the performers. We saw that a minute ago. The argument is that because the same individuals perform both the activities enjoined by visible Vedic texts and those for which such texts are not available, we must infer that such texts must exist in principle for also the latter kind of activity. Shabra defends this inference because it is a human trait to forget as much as it is to remember. In general, when I come to the next guy, 7th century, Kumarila, his position is to the right of Shabra. Kumaril was a giant in the giant in the intellectual tradition of India. Uh, so his, he was very influential. He rejects, for example, Shabra's claim that when a smriti contradicts the Vedic text, then the smriti lacks authority because it lacks the foundation in the Veda. The Veda says to do X, and uh, smriti says don't do X. And the smriti is is. For Veda, all smritis are founded on Vedic text, and therefore, when a provision of smriti contradicts the Vedic provision. He should treat that con conflict in the same way as we do when two Vedic texts contradict each other. And that is quite a common exegetical principle. When two Vedic texts tell you to do two different things, then there is an option. You can do one or the other. So, and he says, given that the Vedic foundation of Spritis has been firmly established about, even when they are in conflict with the Vedic text, how is it possible to recognize a different foundation for them? For Vedic statements are scattered across different Vedic branches, so the argument from the scattered Veda, and are only directly perceived by different individuals. They are not recited according to the order in which the dharmas of individuals are performed. So fearing the loss of the fulsome Vedic tradition, smritis were composed. Now here smriti means a text, right? Not just Smritis were composed without quoting the Vedic text in their original form, the Vedic text being identified by means of writing down their content. So this is an interesting example of why and how the Smritis were written, at least according to him. These Smritis collect in one place the Vedic texts that are not directly perceived, but are being disclosed by that very writing down of their content, which take the place of the specific sounds of the original. Kumarila, for strategic reasons, rejects the view that some Vedic texts are now lost. We have it here, long one. Strategically, he thinks that this view may encourage Buddhists and others, who are the other side, the, her the heretics, and others to claim the Vedic foundation for their own texts, right? which would then be similar to the Smritis. This is very interesting internal and external arguments that is happening uh, uh, for these people, because the Buddhists were their intellectual opponents, who were very, very strong intellectually at this time. So they could also say, hey, Buddhist texts are also based on these lost Vedas, right? And he goes on. Now with regard to those who acknowledge the Smritis also, such as that of Manu, have their foundation in lost Vedic branches, Buddhists and others can easily tell them that their own texts are founded precisely on such Vedic branches. For who is able to limit the scope of statements in lost Vedic branches to just those texts? If they are lost, they are lost. We have no way of finding out what is in them. So Buddhists can say, we have, how can you really tell Buddhists, no, your texts are not found there. We can't do it. 
And therefore, so long as some people have adhered to something for a certain length of time and just gained renown, it may appear to them to have the same authority when one perceives it as having a foundation in lost Vedic branches, even when it may conflict with perceptible Vedic branches. Vedic branches is the same as Vedic text, right? But the, the various Vedic texts are handed down in schools, and that's it. Shabara in the 5th century and Kumari in the 7th century are followed by two major theories of the 9th century from the parallel Dharma Shastra tradition, the legal tradition, Vishwarupa and Medatit, whom I've introduced already. Vishwarupa has an extended commentary on Yanyavalkya Smriti, so the 4th century text, that runs into 14 pages in the printed edition. However, over eight pages of it, including 43 verses, are taken up by a forceful opponent, the Purva Paksha, who, following the views expressed in Mimamsa Sutra 131, argues against the view that Smritis, against the view that Smritis are founded on the Veda, and therefore proper epistemic sources of Dharma. This opponent throws significant light on the debates that must have been raging during this period about the nature of Dharma and its epistemology. He argues that the Veda cannot be the foundation of Smritis, challenging. Um, cha he argues that the Veda cannot be the foundation of Smritis, challenging, first of all, the very basis of this thesis. I will not go into that, given that we are running a little late, but um, I will go on to this, our second person, which is much more important. A noteworthy point in this argument in, the, in Vishwarupa. Uh, is the similarity of the extant texts of the different Vedic branches. He says, the poem says, that even those that are lost should necessarily be of the same kind. That is, have the same, as, that is the same as the extant one, because the different recensions preserved in different branches do not contain widely different matter. The Maitrayani texts, for example, are not radically different from the Kartika texts. Let me explain that to you. The Ved different Vedic branches, one is called Maitrayani, and the other is called Kartika. We have texts from both traditions, and they are parallel. The same moral is the same content. They are different wording, different explanation, but they don't contain radically different content. And he says, so the lost Vedic text must have had the same kind of content, right? And he even, uh, he's sarcastic when he says, uh, we will see later on, Medatiti would say, my gosh, the, the only texts that seem to have all these dharmas of Dharma Shastra, they are the only ones to get lost, right? Not the other ones. So this is very interesting. Medhatiti, now we are coming to this my fourth person, uh, in my judgment, is a much better jurist than Vishwarupa. He's probably an in for me, he's the intellectual giant of this period of, among the jurists. Derret, who is the 20th century's most famous scholar, taught at the uh, London, uh, University of London uh, School of Oriental and African Studies, uh, the foremost historian of Hindu law, calls Medatiti, and I quote, probably the greatest jurist of his science, a substantial distinction. Of the hundreds of jurists whose works are available to us from India, none has labored in quite the same manner as Medhatiti and many of his qualities are unparalleled." Unquote. Within the context of the epistemology of dharma, what distinguishes Medhatiti's discussion is his realistic view of dharma, not merely as ritual activity, but also as law, both civil and criminal. Law that had to be enforced in courts of law. So this is a real problem for him. It's good for, all right, for Shabare and Kumarila to talk about the Veda, but I am a lawyer. I have to go to court. I have to find all these people, whether they are guilty or not. And there I have all these laws that have nothing to do with the Veda, right? Are they also part of Dharma? So this is his problem. He has an expansive view of Dharma. At a theoretical level, he acknowledges openly, the first person to do that, he acknowledges openly that not all the rules and activities comprehended by Dharma are founded on the Veda. In his introductory remarks on the duties of a king called Raja Dharma, the whole section on the duties of the king, he is forthright. And here he says, for the dharmas explained here have their roots in various epistemic sources, pramanantara. Not all of them have the Veda as their root. Even though they may have their roots in other epistemic sources, moreover, the ones explained here are only those that are not in conflict with the dharma shastras. 
The last sentence implicitly admits that some dharmas originating in these other sources may indeed be in conflict with dharma shastric provisions. In many areas of dharma, Medatiti asserts, the foundation is not Veda but reason or Nyaya. I'm sorry, uh, this. Uh, Oh, this is the one I should have had it <laughs> because I, I, I. So this is the very first one that he talks about in his introduction to the section on on um, on um, the duties of the king, and and here then he says, in this manner therefore this entire topic, namely that smritis are rooted in the Veda, um, uh, has reasoning as its root, not the Veda. In other topics also, such as the smritis dealing with legal procedure, court, court how the court should function, Whatever, whenever reasoning is the root, we will point it out as occasion present themselves. Medatiti, like Kumarila, has problems with the notion that of a lost Veda, saying that in this scenario, and this is, we must make numerous implausible assumptions, such as these. There was an improbable, and this is where I talked a minute ago, there was an improbable disregard of the very Vedic branch, which was most useful in which all the dharmas were given, all the dharmas given both in texts of recollection and in texts on the domestic ritual. There's another whole class of Indian literature on domestic ritual called Griya Sutras. Pertaining to all the social classes and orders of life were set forth and all its reciters became extinct. He's saying this is improbable, right? What you say is improbable because 90% of what is found in the Dharma Shastras are not in the extant text. Now you say that they are in the lost text. Okay. So all these things that were most useful for us were actually lost. So he's being a little sarcastic, we will see again. It is difficult to believe, Medatiti says sarcastically, that just those Vedic texts that had all the dharmas laid down in the smritis happened to become extinct. The argument of Medatiti is too detailed and long to be reproduced here in full. It is on for pages and pages. The argue, um, but his conclusion is eye-opening for its frankness. He admits that it is impossible to state clearly the way in which Smriti, or Dharma Shastra, is actually based on the Veda. And he says, he throws up his hands. Therefore, there certainly exists a connection between the Veda and Manu and others with respect to this issue, namely Dharma. It is, however, impossible to determine the specific nature of that connection. When people who know the Veda have doggedly, doggedly resolute re conviction that something must be carried out, then it is appropriate to assume that it is indeed rooted in the Veda and not rooted in something else, such as an error. In this way, an assumption comes to be made with respect to the cause that is in keeping with that confection. Here come, come close to a, to a definition of the Veda as not as real text, but as the repository of truth. So if everything that is true, then it must be in the Veda. It's like, like evangelical Christians say, this is, this is in the Bible. Of course, they never go and check it, right? This, but everything true must be in the Bible, so it is there. Medatiti has, at least from a modern perspective, a refreshingly realistic view of how the legal texts of Manu and others were composed. This is very interesting. He does not buy into the narrative at the beginning of Manu, uh, the text. Uh, there is this whole first chapter which tells you how the text was produced. It came from the creator God. Manu was creator God's son. He got it from his father. Right? This, is, this is the narrative. Medatiti doesn't buy into it. He does not buy into the narrative attached to the beginning of Manu's text that calls him the son of the creator. In his comments on this narrative, Medatiti appears to take it as a pedagogical strategy to make people pay attention to and study the treatise. Right? Medatiti thinks that Manu was simply, like many of us, an entrepreneurial scholar who assembled a group of knowledgeable people with expertise in various Vedic traditions. He probably got a grant from somebody, right, <laughs> to, to hire a lot of graduate students. Gathered medical material from them and composed his work. Now this is what he says. Manu gathered around him a large number of students who studied many different Vedic branches as well as other Vedic scholars. And having learned from them the various Vedic branches, he composed his treatise. By presenting those Vedic branches as its root, he established the authoritative character of his treatise. In this manner, others came, became zealous in performing activities relying upon that treatise. 
and did not strive to discover the, those roots. This is our inference. Elsewhere he says, what Manu and, and others did was to bring together individual details of dharmas that were scattered in this manner so as to make them easy to understand. It was a pedagogical tool. So Manu is authoritative only as a, as a good pedagogue. He is not extraordinary. Even a person living today, he says, can do the same thing. Even in contemporary times when a person endowed with the aforementioned qualities and for those very reasons composed a treatise, he becomes authoritative for future generation, just as Manu and the like. A final revealing comment by Medhatiti with respect to Manu 2.238 shows the expansive notion of Dharma and its epistemology he advocates. The text of Manu says, and I quote, a man with faith should accept fine learning from even a low caste man. The fathers, the highest Dharma, even from the man of the lowest caste, and a splendid woman, even from a bad family. This must have been an adage, you know, a proverb that he uses for his own purposes. Um, how can one get learning from the lowest caste, a chandala, untouchable, who is not supposed even to read the Veda? Medhatiti explains. Oh, no, this one here. The term dharma is employed also with reference to general norms of behavior. So if a chandala were to say this is the dharma in this place, and what does he say? Do not stay too long in that region. There are robbers there. Do not bathe in this body of water. There are crocodiles there. Here this is the dharma among the villagers. This is the statute established by the king. One should not think I must follow the words of my teacher curse on this wretched chandala who dares to instruct me. So what the chandala says to this man is actually dharma. He's teaching him dharma. Another revealing moment comes in Medhatiti's comment on Manu 7.13 and the, the text says, therefore when the king issues a dharma for those he favours as also an unfavourable one for those he does not favour, one should not contravene that dharma. Oh my god, the king can issue dharmas now. If dharma is based on the Veda, how is it possible for a king to issue a dharma? Medhatiti explains. Today, and this is what the king's done. Today in the city, everyone should observe the festival. A wedding is taking place in the councillor's house and everyone should assemble there. So also today, livestock should not be slaughtered by butchers and birds should not be captured. Wealthy people should entertain the dancing girls for this many days. Likewise, also with regard to those he does not favor, one should not associate with this man, this man should not be allowed to enter anyone's house. When the king here promulgates this kind of dharma, by beating of drums and the like, it should not be transgressed. The king, however, does not have power with respect to determining the dharma related to daily, daily fire sacrifice and the like, which are of course Vedic rituals. So the specific and often temporary royal decrees issued ad hoc can also be considered as dharma, according to Medhatiti, even though the king does not have the power to issue rules with respect to Vedic rituals. So, how do you fit a square peg into a round hole? How do you base dharma with its vast scope on the meagre information found in the Veda? The texts themselves refer to various areas of dharma, such as the dharma of a region, dharma of caste, Dharma of a family, Dharma of a guild, Dharma of a village called Desha Dharma, Kula Dharma, Jati Dharma, etc. Can all these have Veda as their source? And that is the, the, the intellectual issue that these people are. In other words, can all the Muslim rules, Islamic rules, be coming directly from the Quran or the Sharia? So this is the question that these people are asking. Several scholars recently have argued convincingly, I believe, that the historical source of dharma in the dharma shastras is not the Veda, but achara, that is the normative behavior and practices of various and varied historical communities. In seeing the Veda or some transcendent tradition as the source of dharma, historians of dharma shastra have bought into the theological position enunciated in most of the dharma shastras themselves, so as to, pro as to the provenance of dharma, that they are teaching. And this, the, the problem is we are confusing that history with theology. 
It is instructive to see how this unyielding theological position, formulated in Mimangsa or ritual exegesis, created all sorts of intellectual problems for the scholars we have reviewed, and for those we have not reviewed, didn't have the time, especially those working within the legal tradition. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. Thank you.